and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and top selling games from April 1988. I check out the ZX printer. I play some games, have a chat with Jeff and report on Replay Manchester. But first, it's the news. Imagine a cross between the Sinclair C5 and the Citroen 2CV. Well, soon you won't have to, because Clive Sinclair and Citroen are rumoured to be in talks to merge the two vehicles. The Citroen 2CV5, as it may be called, is hoped to provide a family-sized car using the shell of the 2CV coupled with the battery technology of the C5, a brave idea that was well ahead of its time. If you wanted something as a child back in the 80s and there was no way it was ever going to happen, the best thing you could do, or so it was thought at the time, was to write to the television programme Jim will fix it. The disgraced presenter would grant your wish if you were unlucky enough to ever be chosen to appear alongside the sleazy git. Andrew Collett wrote to the programme to ask if his new game could be published, and sure enough, the old perv wrangled the deal with Mastertronic, and the game, Super Trolley, was duly published. A careful glance at the inlay will reveal the pervert pushing a shopping trolley. Let's move swiftly along then. Kempston have released a WIMP system, that stands for Windows, Icons, Menus and Pointers, for those that don't know. The system is for their own mouse, and will make your Spectrum look just like an Atari ST, allegedly. The software will include a series of machine code routines to be used from BASIC, so you can even make up your own system. The software is currently missing in action by the way, so if anyone's got a copy, get in touch. With the flood of recent arcade conversions to the Spectrum, Activision has announced it has recently acquired two quality licenses. Firstly, Afterburner, the excellent 3D arcade shooter, will somehow be converted, hopefully before Christmas. And the second is R-Type, a brilliant horizontal shooter. Both of these games will require some top quality programming, and Activision say they are confident this can be achieved. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month are Flying Shark, the shoot 'em up from Firebird. Night Orc, the adventure game from Rainbird. Super Hang On, the motorcycle racing game from Electric Dreams. Platoon, the war game from Ocean. And Kickstart 2, the motorcycle stunt game from Mastertronic. And that was the news and top selling games from April 1988. Many computer manufacturers provided ways for their micros to print. Usually this took the form of an industry standard serial or parallel port. Sinclair, however, in their bid to keep prices low, opted for a proprietary device. The ZX printer was launched in October 1981 and aimed at the ZX81 micro initially, but the design of the Spectrum's interface meant it could also work on that. It costs initially $49.99, and was heavily advertised. This little device became the standard printer for many people. Its small form factor and ease of use meant it could be easily set up and used, and easily incorporated into any software package. It was simple to connect, and it had a through port, although it was not large enough for me to use my smart card. Loading the paper was easy. You disconnected the back, slotted in the plastic bits at each side of the paper roll, fed the paper in and over the top, and then slotted the whole thing back into the printer itself. The sticker on the box stated you would need a separate power supply to use it with the Spectrum, but it seemed to work fine without one. The Spectrum's ROM had built-in functions to allow listing, printing, and a direct full screen dump. The device was small, measuring 14 cm by 7.2 cm and 5 cm high. The styling suited both the ZX81 and Spectrum, and it looked really rather neat. It is not a thermal printer or a dot matrix printer, instead it uses electricity to burn holes into specially aluminium coated paper, and in low light this looked really cool, if a little scary.
Because it uses this method, you do get a distinct burning smell when in use, especially if you are printing a lot of text or screen dumps. The noise it makes will be familiar to anyone who owned one. And it isn't loud enough to become distracting, and certainly not as loud as a dot matrix variant. Speed wise it's not bad, churning out about a line every second, ideal for listing programs, and the quoted specification was 50 characters per second. The quality is not the best to be honest. Because of the paper and the method used, text can sometimes be blurred or out of line. When printing graphics, the results are quite good actually. They are quite clear and the silver paper in this instance does give them that extra something that makes them look different. Using a word processor like TaskWord and printing out 64 characters online produces a readable output, but not something you could use professionally. Then again, this was not aimed at the business market. It was a cheap device for home users to get output from their micro, and for that it was a nice piece of kit. Sinclair stopped producing the unit in May 1984, much to the dismay of users. It was still a much loved and used device. You can pick them up on eBay though, although many of them will need a new drive belt. I quite like this little device. I never bought one back in the day, I, instead I chose an Alphacom 32 which does produce better results, but for sentimental value you can't beat this little printer. Salamander was released into arcade by Konami in 1986. It's a fast-paced horizontal shooter with power-ups, multiple weapons and end bosses. It also had vertical sections, adding a lot of features to keep the player alert. The game was very popular, and there were even albums released featuring the music from the game. The Spectrum version was released in 1987, with many subsequent budget releases including the one I have from the Hit Squad. The first thing that hits you is the poor music. This is for the 1 to 8 machines as well. Why didn't they use the AY chip? The screen size is reduced by a large border too. A typical trick to keep the game speed up. And to be honest it does run at a good pace. However, it is hard. My first two or three attempts ended in a game over very quickly, without even passing the first two large snakes. A few more tries and I finally got past them, having to shoot them in a certain place. This is really difficult, but does mimic the arcade to some extent. The level layout is different too, so being familiar with the arcade won't help you here. There are no background graphics, and obviously the sound has had to be cut back, and to be honest for me the game was a bit of a letdown, especially after playing it at several replay events. On the arcade version I could get to the first end boss relatively easily, but on this version it seems overly difficult, and I never managed it. As you shoot fleets of aliens, they drop power-ups, and these range from multiple shots, outriders and lasers, you know, the usual stuff. And you'll need to get these to get very far in the game. The biggest issue for me was when you get killed, you lose all of your power-ups, and this can leave you in trouble later on in the game, especially if you're approaching an end boss. Things move smoothly and control is responsive, but the difficulty level is just too high for me, and I found myself losing interest quickly. I like a game that lets you make progress, even if it's by trial and error, but this game seems to set out to destroy you at every opportunity, and throws gameplay out of the window. To see later levels I had to use the RZX playback, and the game does give you the vertical sections like the arcade, but the aspect ratio made these parts look very difficult. Overall then, a frustrating game, at least for me, and one that I won't be going back to.
This is Monty is Innocent, released by Gremlin Graphics in 1985. Monty has been very naughty and is in jail, and you control Sam Stoat trying to break him out. To do this, Sam has to first find a key, and then the right cell. There are eight keys and eight cells, so there's a lot of running around. If you're not fast enough as well, you'll die before you've even got a chance to work out what to do. That's very bad game design. The game is the follow-up to the first one, Wanted Monty Mole, and is a different beast altogether. No platform in action, just a lot of searching rooms looking for keys and then searching for the right cell. The pseudo 3D effect can be confusing, and you often find yourself stuck, not knowing where the door is, because it's not obvious which are the exits. There are various things that appear, and touching these will kill you, unless you have a gun. The chasing enemies are a real pain, but you can cheat a bit by exiting and re-entering the screen, and they vanish and reappear after a short time. So you can use this to your advantage. Avoiding these, to be honest, is the main aim of the game, as one touch and Sam will snuff it. Control is responsive, but the game is just a continuous round of enter a room, avoid the nasties, move to the next room, and so on. If you get stuck in this room, I have yet to find a way out. So it's game over really, another instance of bad game design. Some of the screens look nice, with the very simple 3D effect, and the game map is quite small. The RZX playback completes the game in just over a minute, so I guess they have to throw in all these enemies just to try and slow the player down. For 1985, I think it could have been a bit better, and possibly stick to the platform formula that was successful for the first game. If you like wandering about, continuously seeing the same screens and being killed unfairly, then this is the game for you. Otherwise, I would give it a quick try, just to prove my point, and then move on. This is Space Junk, released by Miguatello in 2017. This is a very polished game that has a simple concept, but a very different control system. The aim is to destroy all of the generators, which may sound easy, but because of the way the ship is controlled, it can be very tricky to accomplish this. Although the game uses the usual four directions and fire, the ship rotates on its axis, meaning it is not always facing the correct way to destroy the generator. I've been playing this for a while, and I'm still a bit confused about how to get the ship facing the right way. I found the best method was to move into a little bit of open space, randomly press the direction keys and try again, until eventually you get it right. The graphics are really nice, and the music that plays along really helps to set the game. The only negative thing I can say is if you lose a life, all the generators that you've previously destroyed are reset back, which can be a bit demoralising really, especially if you've only got one of them left. A great little game then, and one definitely worth tracking down and playing. So old hardware. Yeah. 
you've got quite a bit, haven't you? I've got stacks and stacks and stacks of the stuff. And it didn't start off like that. It started off with just a wafer drive that my friend gave me free of charge. Yeah. There are a couple of things that I've paid a lot of money for. But I, most of the things I've got really cheap. I mean, the stack light rifle I got really cheap. I got it for something like 20 quid. Yeah. There's a few things that I'm still looking for, mm. which I'm not going to say because people will snipe me. <laughs> but if you, if you, oh, either, either uh, that or someone with them listening to this could donate it. That does happen. I've heard that happen on other it? podcasts. Yeah. Is it? All oh, right, okay. The few things that I'm looking for are any of the fuller sound units. Um, I'm looking for a DKtronics keyboard or a low-profile keyboard. That's a decent price. If someone hasn't um, stuck the stickers in the wrong... Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm also looking for a VTX 5000 modem. Oh, and a ZX printer. I'm sure lots of people have got ZX printers. I've got a printer. Oh, there you go. I've got a printer and I've got stacks of paper and it has been in my garage for ages. You can have that. I got it with a plus two bundle, by the way. I didn't know it worked on a plus two. It is a printer port on the back. So it, the interface actually goes into the back of the printer port on the plus two. Oh, that's, that's strange because I, 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 I thought it was... I mean, the, the ZX printer works with a ZX81 or a Spectrum. Standard yep. spectrums, and I thought that Amstrad changed the expansion port. So if you're plugging it into the printer port, that's really strange. Yeah, I'll have to check yeah. on that. So the obvious question: you've got lo- loads of hardware. I've only got a few bits, but hmm. the obvious question I think I'd put to you is: which is your favourite, most favourite, and least favourite? Ooh, that's a bit, that's a bit unfair throwing that at me like that. Um, most favourite bit, I think it has to be um, the stack light rifle. It looks and feels. It's a really solid piece of kit. It's just a shame that there weren't that many games written for it, and the games that are written are in basic and are rubbish. I think that, because it's um, it doesn't use what normal light guns do, which is use the raster, it actually picks out the contrast, the difference in contrast, so it'll, it'll find something against a black background. So if you're trying to shoot a yellow target, it will know it's a yellow target, and it will work yeah. without, any, without any screen flicker, which is great, except the games are awful. And they didn't go ahead and, and do any more. But the whole thing just looks so so brilliant. It's just a pity that it's rubbish. <laughs> so that's, I would say I would say that's my favourite for, for that thing, for that fact. It's it's you know it's such a contradiction in itself. Yeah. Least, least favourite. Yeah. My least favourite piece of hardware was reviewed in the first episode of this series, which is the micro command. Do you know the voice speech recognition? Oh yeah. They they look brilliant in the adverts, and I've I've always looked for them on eBay, and they very rarely come up. And when they do, they're very expensive because they're really rare. And I saw one mislisted about six months ago, and when I got it, the the box is in mint condition. Well, there's a little bit of damage on one corner. Everything looks like it's a display model that's never been used. The interface is spotless, never been plugged in. The microphone and the tape, everything is brand new. And again, it's crap. Absolute crap. The, <laughs> the, the, the games that come with it don't work. And the way you have to do it, you have to teach it your voice. So obviously you start off with saying left and right, and it gets it wrong even on the basics of things. You can say things like sausage and, I don't know, and, and factory and road, and it'll just say, oh, yes, okay, that's left, and move your character left. It's, I mean, the box is brilliant. The uh, advertising is brilliant. The concept is good. It's just a total disaster. It is. It's... <laughs> <laughs> and consider, considering that they cost so much on eBay now, um, it's just a complete waste of time. But there's, I've, um... I've got relatively little then. Although, I've picked up... The, so I've got the ZX printer I mentioned earlier. I've got yeah. a ComCon, which I, I like. Um, yes. And I've got, I've got three RAM Turbo interfaces. Three? Yeah. So the very first one I got with my Spectrum, original Spectrum I've mentioned before. The second one, a few years ago, I was I was looking for one. I couldn't find it at my parents, and I was looking for another one, and I found one on eBay, so I bought it. And it was it's actually one with the reset button that I really like as well. Yeah. And then the third one I got in the bundle, so I bought a big bundle of stuff off eBay, and it was it was there. It wasn't even in the picture; it was just there. So so I've got three. Really love them because that's for nostalgic reasons. Like the ComCon, I've actually built myself a two button joystick because it has two fire buttons. I don't think you mentioned that in the review, did you? No, I didn't know it had. Didn't you notice that there were six connectors on it, not five? No, no. Yeah, there are six connectors on the ComCon, um, and there's two fire buttons. Oh, sorry, sorry, the, the interface. I was thought I thought you meant the joystick port. Yes, there are two fire buttons. on. There's two leads, aren't there, that, yeah. that, that come out the top and you can plug in. Was, but, was there any joysticks around at the time that used them? Yeah, there were. In fact, you know the old ComCon adverts? If you look at those, they advertised the joystick that went with it that had two fire buttons. 
Oh, right, okay. But you've got to... I've actually opened it up and had a look inside. There's two pins on the, the nine-pin de-adapter that will map to the fire button. But one of them on common interfaces is the uh, five-volt button. So I'm not sure about wiring that one up. So I wired the other one up. <laughs> Um, Here we go again. <laughs> Jeff blowing things up. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff trying not to blow things up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's great for things like attic attack. Well, you, well, you can use it to pick up, uh, one to shoot and one to pick up and collect. Yep. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. yeah, exactly. And then I've got a few other bits. I've got loads of... If you if you buy bundles off eBay, I tend not to do this very much anymore now, but you always seem to get some kind of... I've got chemist and joystick interfaces and things like that. Interesting to hear about how much you've got, though, Paul. Originally, when I um, back in the eighties, I I did have bits of hardware. I had an interface one and microdrive. Mm. Uh, I had two microdrives because um, I was one of the very few people that ran a bulletin board off my Spectrum. So I had a, a VTX five thousand modem, mm. a microdrive, and uh, interface one and twin microdrives. But that was that was good because that opened up a whole whole world of um, comms and bulletin boards. This was always going to be a section where you talked more than me, Paul, because you've got, I, know, I know you've got tons, which won't make oh, me think about it. I was thinking, yeah, I thought I thought last week you'd ask it. In fact, I thought when I originally said this of saying what's the worst and what's the best. Right. I'm not, yeah, this is a very, very tricky question because there's so much tat that was released for the Spectrum. <laughs> and, and, yet there was, there, and yet there was a lot of good stuff as well. And it's a matter, I mean, the Spectrum is brilliant an excellent piece of kit but then you move on to things like we've already mentioned like the micro command and it's just anyway <laughs> I, th- I think i think that that's enough for hardware <laughs> this is meteoroids by dk tronics released in 1982 if you haven't guessed by the title, this is a version of the arcade classic Asteroids. For those of you not familiar with the game, you control a spaceship that can rotate, fire, thrust and use hyperspace to move to a different area of the screen. Sadly that particular element is missing from this game. This is a Don Priestley game too, the same person who wrote Flunky, Maisie Axe and Trapdoor, but this is a very early effort. And to be honest, it shows. The ship only has eight rotation points, and the controls can be a bit unresponsive at times. Things move in character-based jumps, and the asteroids do not represent the arcade counterparts. Sound is used well though, with some nice zapping and explosion effects. The thrust key moves you in the direction you are facing and the inertia means that you slow down gradually, so it's easy to control. As each asteroid, sorry, meteoroid is hit, it breaks into small parts. This is a very annoying element for this game, because if you hit one of the larger meteoroids close to your ship, it splits into eight or four pieces, and these are positioned around the original meteoroid, meaning they can generate right over the top of your ship. To get a good game then, it's best not to use the thrust and not to hit meteoroids that are close to your ship. Just keep spinning and firing. For a game that's just over 4k in size, it's playable, but certainly not the best version of the classic game. It's that time of year again, when Manchester hosts Replay Expo, and I get a chance to catch up with Jeff, play some classic arcade games, shop around for bargains, and generally have a great day out. This year's event had masses of arcade cabs, as they always do, and I grabbed plenty of games on classics such as Tempest, Star Wars, Galaxian, and Juno First, to mention but a few. It was easy to get a game too, not too many queues. The only machines that had queues were the sit-down cabs like Outrun and Afterburner. The pinball tables too were out in force, probably more than previous years, 
and although Jeff had a few games, I was happy to just watch. Again, there was a lot of consoles out, all ready to play, with the usual Mega Drives, NES, SNES, Amigas, Ataris, Playstations, Xboxes, and a whole host of other offerings, including a Commodore PET. The noise level was loud, but in the arcade section they were pumping out 80s classics, which made for a great atmosphere. There was quite a few talks taking place too, in particular Specky Sunday, with Jim Bagley, Andrew Hewson, Andy Remick, Rich Stevenson, John Hare and Steve Turner. The Spectrum showing was better than previous years, but still only four machines, at least the ones I could see. There were a few YouTube people there too, the Retro Hour guys were there of course hosting the shows, and I also managed to have a quick chat with Kim Justice at the Specky Sunday event. I bought some old and interesting computer magazines too, as well as a few Spectrum games. And for me, this year was much better than previous ones, and I really enjoyed it. I can't wait for next year's events to start.